Welcome to another episode of EB's Real Talk, where we, you know, we go down the rabbit hole. We do it respectfully, but we love our brothers. Today, today, I got a gentleman that is, has a vast amount of information that I think will be good for the public. How you doing? I'm good. 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 Introduce good. yourself. Tell people who you uh, are. I'm Tom Abdi Shaheed. Uh, I'm a writer, an imam, and a regular guy. <laughs> a regular guy? Right. That was a little modest. <laughs> that kid was a little modest. You, when you say regular guy, what does that mean to you when you say that? Cause no better and no worse than anybody else. Okay. How important is it that you mentioned that? Because you mentioned that right at the end of your introduction. Well, I just thought it was a good thing to say because that's real. Okay. And since we're dealing with a real talk show, I think we should just be real about everything. <laughs> All right. All right. So so what, what I want to do is I want to break this, this interview up in a bunch of se a couple segments here because I want to make sure people get not just information about who you are, but the whole topic of why we even here in the first place. Sure. One of the things I want to talk about, uh, maybe a little more uh, self-satisfying uh, me, is you mentioned your bio mentions that you play a little bass. Yeah, I used to. Okay. Uh, I uh, actually I picked the bass up when I was in Stockholm, Sweden. Sweden. Okay. There was a place uh, called um, Nolin. Okay. Nolin was a place that during the day. They had these rooms that were very uh, suited for playing music. They had very good acoustics. Ah, okay. And uh, it was also a place that at night, after all of the clubs closed and you had a lot of entertainers that came to town, uh, they would come there and jam at night and jam <laughs> all the way until the morning. All right, okay. So one morning, one afternoon actually, I went to Nolan's when there wasn't anybody uh, doing anything and there was a bass in the corner of the room. And I said, you know, I knew all the stance, how to hold it, but I never knew anything about it. Okay. So I picked it up and I started just fiddling around with it. And there was a guy named um, Les. Uh, he came in and he saw me holding the bass and pulling on the strings. I, did, I didn't know anything. That's the first time I ever picked a bass. Really? Ever, ever. Okay. And he asked me, did I want to play a gig up in the northern part of Sweden? <laughs> and I said, you got to be kidding me. You know, I said, right. I sound that band. And he told me, he said, no. He said, no, I'm serious. He said, I'm serious. He said, all you have to do is be black, you understand, to have an instrument in your hand and pull the strings, and the Swedes won't know the difference. <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's what he told me. Okay? So I said, no. No, I just couldn't. That was too fake. You know, <laughs> okay. I mean, no. You know, yeah. so then when I got back to the States, uh, one of the times I came back, I went to Higby's. It was a store that used to be downtown, an old yeah. store. Mm -hmm. And they had a display base on, uh, it was a K, called the name of it was called a K base, K A Y. And it was a display base, so I was able to get it for a discount, uh, $400, well, back in 1963, 64, that was a lot of money. Yeah, but yeah. still, you know, I was able to get it, and a good friend of mine, uh, we ran together right after, from high school all the way until, you know, a little later in life. His brother was named Albert Eiler. Albert Eiler. Albert Eiler uh, was a new avant-garde musician. He was playing in Europe. And... Um, he came back to the United States, and I had a Busher 400 horn okay. at the time. This so you played horn be prior to right, the bass. Right, I was, okay. you know, going taking lessons. Okay. And I had, it was a Busher 400, and uh, that Busher 400 was sold to me by a friend of mine. And uh, so Albert came over to my parents' house. I was staying at my parents' house on Glendale, and he came there, and uh, he said, that's a nice horn. And he picked it up, and he started playing it. So when he got finished playing it, I sold it. Okay. Really? Why? Why? I is said, that? no, come on, man. No. No. I said, you know, if I'm gonna be at the top of the game, I gotta surpass him. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So it really was yeah. just okay. He, yeah, he, he so plays. He plays a little right. better than you. Yeah, okay. Man, please, man. <laughs> so yeah. I said, this is not my interest. So that's when I start really start getting focusing okay. on the base. Now, so one of the things that also mentioned in your bio mm -hmm. is um, I had to go back and look at it again because mm -hmm. it said bass violin, right. which is a rare instrument, especially mm -hmm. in the urban culture. Right. Uh, did, that came after the bass? The regular no, no, no. That, that's what they call a bass. Double bass. Double bass. Yes, a double bass. Or they, they have a dollar name. A bass fiddle, bass violin, double bass. Ah, okay. You know, that's, right. So they're all basically the same instrument. Okay. The all musicians, right. that's what they call them. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And uh, what did music teach you about you at that time? Because you kind of transferred... I mean, your mindset went, uh, went on music at first, right? No. It was on writing. You right. Know, you started when you was young. Right. But what... 
what were you able to transfer? I freedom mean, of expression. Okay. You know, that music in particular. It was basically unstructured, and it was something that you played what you felt. Okay. And, you know, it, it, I fit in with Improvisation. Without, it, improvisation. Yeah, it was like free music. That's what they used to call it, free music, okay. not avant-garde jazz. It was free music. It was free from all of the, the restraints that, you know, European music, you know, had on it, staying within this measure and that measure. And Albert Isley, he could play seven octaves above his horn. He had a Selma, uh, a Selma, uh, I think it was a Selma four or five. And uh, he used to play five or six octaves above the... Uh, above the register on the horn, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So he, he provided a lot of freedom, you know, and I had a very good ear because I never could read music. Okay, you, you know, play by ear. I could I play it by ear. But every, I could play the solo of a trumpet player, I could play the solo of the uh, saxophone player, and I could still hold the bottom line of the bass. So when you said freedom of expression, mm -hmm. why do you think that that was important to you? How old were you then? 20, 21, 22, 23 in that area. So even at that age, you know, based on where you went mm -hmm. uh, after that, but it seems to me that's where you really start uh, discovering and how, how the importance of having freedom of expression. Right. Well, yeah. you know, one of the things that never made sense to me, I mean, I never knew what it was because I was too young. Uh, in high school, that's where it really started uh, coming clear to me. Okay. About the differences between you know black people and white people. Okay. So you do you feel do you feel that music was a was a liberation? Well, n not necessarily. It was just something that was there that didn't have any restrictions. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. And uh, so I gravitated toward that. And um, the, the 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 writing was something that I was always trying to break free from structure but it but it in a sense mm -hmm. writing has a, a bit of a stop on different ends because for instance you know just, just if, 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 if I'm writing poetry mm -hmm. it has to have a certain structure otherwise it's not considered poetry right sure. correct sure so in, in a sense does that constitute why you change maybe over to music because maybe there was a lot more restrictions in writing no I, I wasn't that advanced at the time, okay, you know, so I didn't really understand any of that wow. until I ran into Russell Atkins back in nineteen in sixty six. So he was the one that came to we, we he had a workshop, okay, a writer's workshop on ninety third and Anzo Road on Superior in Superior. Okay, yeah, and that's where I got a glimpse into structure and grammar. Okay, 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 and that was something that he was somebody I was drawn to. Because of the fact he was an avant-garde poet, okay. Explain, I was an avant-garde musician. Exp yeah, explain that word again. I mean, avant-garde. Mm -hmm. Avant-garde was something that is advanced guard. It's it's before uh, anybody catches on. It's before uh, it's a trend-setting kind of philosophy, uh, a kind of movement. Okay. And he was an avant-garde poet. Right. So okay? he was trying to. It was a movement with even in the styles, even in the way it was being. Uh, right. He was like you know really. A brilliant. He was a genius, actually, okay. but he was never recognized, and he could never he could never get published, you know, by the magazines and the periodicals that he wanted to get published by. So he had to start his own uh, uh, a journal, okay. you know. Okay. And uh, so I was still playing music at the time that I met Russell. Okay. Okay. I had okay. just okay. Uh, Albert and 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 Donnie and. You know, all of you musicians, they were like gravitating to New York. I was going back and forth to New York playing gigs, and we used to play gigs at, uh, not gigs, it was like jam sessions at Leroy Jones's house when he moved in, the, when he was living in the village. Okay, so uh, on the subject of freedom again, because mm -hmm. I you, you keep, we keep alluding back mm -hmm. to that, I noticed that when you transferred, or, or just for lack of a better word, when you kind of moved into these different uh, ex freedom of expressions, every time you found a restriction, is it fair to say every time you found a restriction, you went back and forth? Did you go back and forth to the music and the writing? Well, no. At one time, at some point, I stopped playing music. Okay. Because, number one, I saw the limitations and the exploitation of the musicians. What do you what do you explain the exploitation by the producers, by the record labels, by the people who were paying them. 
okay, to do what it was they were doing, okay? okay? So what happened is I just, I just felt that it was, uh, I wasn't prepared to live in squalor. Okay. Okay. I, I never lived in squalor. My, right. You know, my parents, they always provided for us a nice place to, to be. I grew up like that. Okay. And I'm not ashamed of it. Okay. You know, when you say squalor, it, it, I mean, so, you know, so roaches you, and rats and mice. <laughs> so you said some of the musicians. Right. Because they wanted to make it so bad. Right. And they were willing to just express themselves. Right. They were so anxious to do it. They were willing to work for less, which right. caused them to live in squalor. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that wasn't something you were. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that. Okay? okay. And then, especially when I focused in on the fact that uh, these people were not being treated fair, and they were not being treated fair by the same people that I became aware of in my travel from here. Okay. Because I saw how I was treated differently in another place that was not my country. Okay. 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 So All right. that made me keenly aware of, you know, what I was dealing with, man. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so when I was, I had a gig, I was playing with Norman Connors. Okay. And Norman, we went to his house to practice. Okay. okay. Norman lived on Central Park. Really? He, he had shiny floors. <laughs> there was nice stuff, man. I didn't see any roaches. <laughs> Everything was beautiful, man. So he was saying, you know, why don't you stay in New York? Mm -hmm. And you know you can play you know play with me. I said, can I, ha I will I have a place like this? And he said, well, you know, I said, yeah, okay, no, no, man, forget about that. Yeah. So again, we're back to that freedom, and, right. and so excuse me for going back to that no, I stayed because it seems together. like it mm -hmm. seems like you had enough wisdom or maybe some upbringing. So let me mm -hmm. go to there. Was there upbringing that caused you to be that keen? to where you'd be restricted at? Because some people can't read between the lines right. and they just keep rolling on. What made you, what do you think uh, prepared you for how sharp you were on being able to pick that up? I think my father did, more or less, because he was very, very sharp. He was an attorney, okay? And he worked his way through law school. He graduated summa cum laude from, uh, I think it was Western Reserve and then John Marshall School of Law. He was extremely sharp. And uh, there would be conversations that he would, hey, he never talk much. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the ways that he responded to certain kinds of things. Okay. I remember one incident in particular. Uh, we were in the rec room in the basement, and this Cuban Missile Crisis had taken place. Mm -hmm. And it was in the process of doing whatever it was doing. And I was talking about, I'll go, I'll go like that. He asked me, say, are you out of your damn mind? <laughs> and I was like, huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So when I came back from Sweden the first time, the... Um, Back then they had a draft board. Okay. You had to you had to apply for the draft, you know, and you got classified. And Vietnam was going on at the time. I didn't know it. I didn't even I didn't even know there was a war. I was living in freedom in Sweden, and all of the taboos that were here, there were none there. Yeah, because you you just but but there was some things that were familiar, but that particular thing wasn't there at the time. What do you mean? When you when you said earlier, you you talked about some of the things like in the exploitation was universal basically right they was exploiting people even in sweet well not really yeah i never got to that level okay you know okay, where i was yeah, going okay. to be signing any record label or doing any of that kind of thing i never even thought about anything like that i mean okay. i never even thought about making music a career okay just like i never thought about making writing a career okay. you know i'm free from that because i don't want anything okay? okay anything that somebody has it all depends on what the downside is if the downside for me is too steep, like if I got to spend too much time, if I got to be fake, if I got to be phony, if I have to go through all kind of changes that, you know, in order to make that happen, I don't need it. So, so, what do you think that? So, how important? And and I I think I know the answer to this. How valuable do you think your ability to make choices of your freedom and your choices? How valuable is that to you? Precious. There's no, you can't put a value on it. You know, I've been offered all kinds of stuff across across the board. And I look at the downside. If the downside is too steep, I do not want it. Because okay. money is like steam off of a pot. Okay. As soon as you take the top off, the steam is gone, you need some more. Okay, so the thing is not money, no. so this is, this is for now. So if we, if I, if I say to you that the music was a great way for you to express yourself. You could have made a lot of money in it. And I tell you that, hey, the books could have made you famous. To you, those two are the same. Yeah, I don't care about it. Okay, those that, two are the that same. That doesn't matter to me. The, the, what matters to me is that 
we have a saying that true wealth is self-contentment. And that's what I'm concerned about. I, I sleep until I wake up. You know, I don't have, somebody asked me one time, they said, so, well, you know, we were having a nice conversation. I guess this really messed the conversation up. We were having a very nice conversation and stuff. And they said, well, you know, what do you do? I said, nothing. I said, nothing? I said, nothing. And all you have to do, if you want people to bother, stop bothering you, tell them you write poetry. <laughs> you are insane as far as they're concerned. He writes poetry. Poetry don't sell because their stuff is based on, you know, how much money you're making. Right. You know, it's not how much, you know, what kind of self-contentment you have. It's like if you're not a number one bestseller, you're not making any money. Most people don't make any money in publishing. If you think you're going to get rich and make money in poetry or writing books, then you need to go see. So I got a bridge. I can see. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. That's right. That's not going to happen. Again, it was it was about your freedom of expression. And, and I see that that's taken you a long way. So now let's fast forward a little bit. And, and I saw that you wrote, wrote what? How many books did you written? Uh, my publisher has. I don't even think he really knows. You know, <laughs> I think maybe around sixteen or something. All right. Like that. What was it important? Was was it more important for you to get the number of books out, or was the the thought that was in those uh, amount? Of well, books? the thoughts they just came. You know, I mean, I didn't have to think about anything. It just was flowing. That's the only way you can do that. Okay. Okay. And what happened is I had stopped writing for. 30 plus years. I wrote absolutely nothing. I was dealing with another part of my development that had been uh, left to rot. So, so let's, let's talk about that development. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that development. If you had to phrase or to give that development a title, what would that be? Spiritual development. Okay, you know, what does that mean? Explain to me, that. it means to, uh, tightening up my relationship with my Creator. Okay. And making sure everything that I understand about what He has. Uh, revealed is coaching with everything else that is important to me in my life. Okay. And it just so happened that it took a long time for me to find my voice in the way I look find, again. And because I stopped writing in 1968, 60, 1968, 1969. And I started again back into 2001. Okay. Somewhere around in there. Maybe later even. Okay. We're going to go down a little rabbit hole a little bit okay. on this. All right. Because the one thing that you've been telling me for the last few uh, minutes here is one, the thing that I got is you don't like restrictions. But in a sense, there are those who believe that even finding a faith, quote unquote, at, puts some restrictions. That's okay. did, did you, was, was, why was those particular restrictions acceptable to a person that was always living in freedom? Especially well, because what it did just made me freer. Because the restrictions that I was looking at were limited. The restrictions, the universal restrictions, you know, there are no rim, real limits to that. You know, it just depends on what level you, you focus, you function in on. Okay. If you're functioning within a certain paradigm, then you you got you, you know, you got restrictions. Okay. If you're functioning in another one, in a universal paradigm, then what other people are restricted to, you're not. Okay. So it's the same thing. That freedom and my uh, understanding of those restrictions, as one would call them, I really, I, I don't even think that's a good term. Yes, I, I'm just, I, I think, I think maybe, maybe we'll say, uh, do you, did you feel? Let me ask it this way: mm -hmm. Do you feel like there was a, you needed a necessary path for yeah, because, yourself? Yeah, because I was making it up as I went along. Okay. And you know, right. I'm not the doer nor the deity. Okay. Okay. So I understand that there's something greater than myself. Okay. And that was what I was trying to get to. Okay. And uh, I did. And once I got to that, then I was comfortable moving on. Okay. You know, right. but the same basic mentality always remained. Okay. What the was core that? Person, that's freedom. The freedom. The freedom. The freedom, freedom of expression. The freedom, freedom of expression. Right. Um, in that freedom of expression, and now a guide to that freedom of expression, what did you find? What did you find? Peace of mind. And, and peace of mind, explain peace of, that. Peace of mind is just, it, peace of mind is different for different people. Okay. You know, some people find peace of mind in heroin. Some find it in alcohol. Some find it in gambling or women. You know, I find mine, I find my peace of mind in knowing that I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, sync with the universal law. Okay, all right, okay, okay. yep. And, and, and that, that came, with that came a special, uh, comfortableness, if, right? Comfort, yeah, it was a comfort. Yeah, comfort. It was right. like comfort. Okay. Right. 
All right, and and so uh, let's talk a little bit about where you're at. And you're an imam, right? How long? Yeah. Did, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's really funny about that because what happened is in 1969, actually I started what we call the Dickens a lot prayer. Okay. Uh, I started off, I didn't know that there was a thing called an oath of conversion. I had no idea. That. I just knew, oh, okay, <laughs> let me start making a lot. So, I mean, I'm making a lot. I'm going to the mosque. I'm learning the Quran. I'm doing all of these things. And then one day, I'm on what was called a tabliki jamaat. That's where you go around the, the country or the state or wherever from mosque to mosque. And you, you know, you learn and you teach and you try to give uh, what we call instructions or try to. Uh, uh, reinvigorate people who have strung from the path, okay. you know, right. gone off the path. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I found that comfortable, but it was too comfortable because I was like living like a bum. I mean, the way that I understood it, it wasn't enough for me because I was, when I, before I even became involved in the religion, I was a black nationalist. And the, the nationalist movement was like something where it was about uplifting the people, uh, doing for yourself, getting self-respect, cleaning up your neighborhoods, all of those kind of things. But this particular branch of the religion, they didn't do any of that. They just went around and they laid up in the mosques and, you know, people came in and they would eat dates and all the rest of that. <laughs> you know, and that wasn't enough for me. All right, when you say it wasn't enough for you, what did right. you mean by I, that? There wasn't enough activity in the community to bring okay. other people who didn't have any consciousness into this level of kind this was just going from Muslim to Muslim well what about the people who didn't have any kind of consciousness that was what my understanding was in the nationalist days was that you're supposed to reach out to people okay. to bring them up okay and you again know? again back you you're back to a, a theme that seems to be uh, in, in all your what you're saying is the freedom comes with the responsibility and right, the right. Of responsibility. Right. And you saw your responsibility, even though you need to find, well, you found some kind of comfort in yourself. You still feel like it was missing something because it didn't have a responsibility attached to it. Am well, right? what happened is when I got involved in religion, it automatically gives you responsibility. You have a responsibility to your body. You have a responsibility to your parents. You have a responsibility to your neighbor. You have a responsibility to uh, uh, your children, to your wife. It says the best amongst you is the one who treats his wife the best. You know, paradise lies at the mother's feet. I mean, those are the kind of things that made a lot of sense to me. I was like, wow, yeah. all the beatings my mother got me, I still got paradise <laughs> at her feet. What? And I agreed with it. <laughs> so you've okay. been, so how long have you been in the faith of, of Islam? 48 years. 48 years. Mm -hmm. All right. What is, what is your biggest accomplishment um, in Islam? Uh, and, and including the an answer, I would love for you to to offer when it, when it involves a community and maybe some even some self evaluation. Uh, what what was the biggest accomplishment for you? Well, we had a uh, prison program, and we were the first uh, Islamic organization in the country to have a contract with a state to provide religious services to inmates of the okay. Islamic faith. Okay. 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 And all of this is cataloged. It's in uh, Western Reserve Historical Society, okay. uh, Georgia State University. It's you know it's it's cataloged. You know the pictures, the, the letters, all of that's there. Okay. And I think that I look at that as one of our biggest accomplishments. Okay. And I, I don't talk about me. I'm talking about us. Okay. When you say us, you include your everybody. Kind of everybody. Everybody who helped. Okay. And that includes the prison officials. That's right. 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 So there are some there are some uh, um, some things I want to talk about in in, in the religion. I want to clear up some discrepancies and some miscalculations of, of some people that have seen, seen it. Um, but we're going to get back with you in a minute and we're going to talk more about we're gonna, my brother here has a lot of information to come back and join us here at EB's Real Talk. Hey there, brothers and sisters. This is EB Smith. Real Talk is me helping you by giving you information. I know you will be inspired to be a greater you. And with a greater you, our communities are better and our world is better. But I wanna reach more people. To do that, I need your help. Will you subscribe and share my videos? Tell everyone what we're talking about here on Real Talk. Another way to partner with me, donate $1. That's donating just $1. Go to PayPal and send ebsrealtalk at gmail.com. Go to PayPal, donate $1 send 
EBS Realtalk at gmail.com. Since we don't like the world we live in, let's change it together. Thank you. Writing a book can be daunting. But once you get past the daunting, it's always the cost of getting it published. And many times that usually holds people up from doing it. Uptown Publishing is offering supporters of EB's Real Talk a wonderful opportunity to have their books published for only $250. That's 75% of the regular standard publishing package price. You supply the book cover art, a synopsis of your book, and your pre-edited manuscript. And here's what you'll get. 100% control of your book. 100% profits from your book and your own dashboard. That's $250, which is 75% of a regular standard price. 100% of control of your book, 100% of profits. If you're interested in it, go to UptownMediaVentures.com. Go to UptownMediaVentures.com and go to the Contact Us page and put in EB's Real Talk. Or mention EB's Real Talk via email at UptownLiterary at gmail.com. That's UptownLiterary at gmail.com. Congratulations to all of you, to your future as an author.